Hey guys, today's episode is a year-end review with Krista Glenny Sechu, the food editor at Buffalo Spree and the creator of Nickel City Chef. Donnie and Krista talked about all the big things that have happened in Buffalo's food scene this year. This is part one of a two-parter, so make sure you check the second one out as well. Well, Krista, when you came down to our basement 11 months ago now, (laughs) uh, I didn't realize uh, where this podcast was going. I actually thought that we were going to do maybe like five episodes and then nobody. Yeah, and then we would be like, you know, that's too much work. We're not going to do it. But here we are sitting here for episode 49. Wow. This is going to be. Wow. Yeah, and you're our first repeat guest, which... That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a little freaked out, though, about sitting where 49 other people I know have sat. (laughs) I don't know about that, but... Yeah, we've had an interesting collection of characters down here. It's been been fun. But I want to talk to you about about 2012. It was, I think, a big year for both of us. Yes, in lots of ways. Yes, in lots of ways. And and a big year for Buffalo's food scene. I think, like I, I say this with every guest we have, in the three years that we've been doing Buffalo Eats, well, this will be our fourth year. Uh, the food scene has like gone up. It, it's on a, a steady progression going up as far as quality and options and, and people's awareness. And so, I agree. I think the restaurant industry was a little stagnant for quite a while. Yeah. From like 1995 to maybe 2007. and <laughs> That's a little while. And it, Well, it was stagnant for longer before that. There was a big change in 1995, but I think that um, in the last couple of years there's been uh, actual community that's been built and that that has inspired and put energy behind efforts. It's just been exciting. Yeah. I, 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 every month it seems like there's a new reason for me to get excited, whether it's a new event or a new restaurant that's opening Mm -hmm. or, or news of restaurants that are opening. Like it just seems like everyone is so excited to try new things. It's true. And there's so many new people people who have returned to buffalo or people who are not originally from buffalo who live here now yeah who are excited and part of becoming part of this foodie culture it's growing yeah exponentially every day <laughs> yeah and uh and so i figured we'd go over some of the new restaurants that have opened some of the new trends that have happened kind of just discuss them talk about how we cool. think about it and and we'll go from there it's you, you know that you know the drill i know the drill <laughs> <laughs> I think the biggest food story that we have to probably start with is the renovations and the opening of Hotel Lafayette. I agree. And with Mike A's, Butterwoods, and Pan Am. Yep. Um, I mean, I think Mike A's is Buffalo's first true crazy fine dining experience. Like, our, our first restaurant that could literally be nationally recognized as, like, a, a great, you know institution. I don't know. I it has the potential definitely to be that. I think that's true if you factor in the fact that it's in a historical building. Yes. That the renovations especially now that they've moved all the decor and sort of the zhuzh yes. into the dining room. <laughs> yes, yes. The um, dining the room now that, matches the, the exactly. food. Exactly. Yeah. The wine list, the cocktails are out of this world all the time. Yes. And and plus of course the food is yeah. phenomenal and in some ways Surprising, Yeah. And so if you marry all of that together, I completely agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's when we went to that tasting back in, I think, maybe June. Maybe yeah, I think June? that's about right. Um, I said it then and I'll still say it now. It's the best meal I've ever had in Buffalo. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And uh, and we I mean, I've had, you know, 300 <laughs> meal, <laughs> meals in the city. Um, not all of them fine dining, of course. But uh, yeah, I, I was just shocked at what. When when we had Mike down here and, and we talked about like what he was going to do with it and he was mentioning Steakhouse but he was trying to say that they're going to do other things. Yes. At the time, I had no clue that how ambitious their menu was going to be. Well, what I love about it is that it is ambitious, but it's not foreign. No, and not foreign in like a bad way. I mean, like <laughs> it's not where unrecognizable. Like even yes. my mother or somebody who exactly. is not a foodie could go in there and find recognizable food yes. and enjoy that food, but still be surprised and impressed with how innovative or interesting exactly, the interpretation yeah. is. And I think that that's a hard little window to hit. I think that people go too are too safe or go too far in the other direction. Exactly. And it's not approachable and and still tasty. It's just out there. Yeah. Um and Mike and Ed have done a really fantastic job. And of course the front of the house and Tony in the lounge yeah. is just this cohesive experience that is really um unique and special and I think 
being a person who lives downtown, I think it's also important to say what a difference having the Lafayette open yeah. and having Rocco do so make such an effort to make the exterior feel approachable. Like, when you go in there, there are people who are just walking through to check it out. Yeah. You know, it's not yeah. that you have to have some kind of special, you know, black card <laughs> to get in the door or something. Exactly. They've put stanchions up and awnings and flowers and Christmas trees and all kinds of things to make the exterior as warm as the interior. And I think it just really changes the whole vibe of that area downtown, which yeah. I think will trickle into the other neighborhood neighbors' uh, buildings that are empty on Washington Street. I think I we're going to so. see that happen a lot in the next couple of years. All those little empty buildings, a <laughs> block or two between yeah. the Book Arts Center and Mohawk, where Lloyd is, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the hotel kind of wake up and, and start to be busy. And I yeah. think that's going to be great. It's uh, and, and the best part is... They 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 also like cater to, um, more than just one price range. In my case, so if you don't have a lot of cash, their lounge menu is fabulous. Is fantastic. The fuck California burger <laughs> is the best one. It is. It is maybe one of my favorite burgers in Buffalo. If not, it's the best. so good. Yeah, and the, and the that great onion soup croquette that we yeah. love yes. is, is is on the lounge Which menu. Which any Buffalonian would love that 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 thing. It's, I, it's so hearty yeah. and warm and delicious, and yeah. it's nothing crazy or over the top. So I do think the lounge menu is accessible, and I also think. That the um, that even if you just go in for small plates and appetizers exactly. into the restaurant, it's it's really not beyond anyone's yeah. means. But then I I love the other end where they're not afraid to put something high end on the menu, and you can go there and get arguably the best cut of right. beef that you'll find in in Ab- Buffalo, absolutely. if not New York State. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know what's interesting is. When I started doing events several years ago, there were these glass ceilings of how much you could charge for things. Yeah. You could never have a ticketed dinner and sell a ticket for more than $80. Or you could never, <laughs> you know, have a pre-fee that was more than this amount of money. And na- there, that's not a question anymore in Buffalo. People will pay $150 for oma- for the um, the omakase, the, yeah. the, you know, chef's tasting yeah. at, um, at Lafayette Hotel. And it's worth every fucking penny. <laughs> <laughs> It is. I've had most of those options, but yeah, I, it. So it's cool that they're they're not afraid to take these risks, right? The high end financial risks, and I think that you know that's only going to trickle down like uh, along with the area, but to other restaurant owners being like, well, if they can right. do it and they're pulling it off, like why don't we? It's try true. It? Although I think Mike had Mike has earned the trust of his true. customer base. It, he is the guy who you'd C-bar want. Bar is there. swamped on a Monday at five o'clock. Yeah. Swamped, and yeah. it's because people know that whatever money they spend, and Sea Bar isn't expensive by no, the way at, at all. all. No, but if people know for whatever money they spend, they're going to be completely happy with their meal. Yeah. It's going to arrive to the table in a reasonable amount of time and at the right <laughs> temperature, and their server is not going to sit at the table and chat with them, which is one of my pet peeves, <laughs> or show pictures of their children from their wallet oh. or any of that stuff. They're just going to be a server who brings your food and smiles and brings your check and leaves. Yes, and. He set that standard, and that's why people trust him at my gaze. I think yeah. had he gone from not having Sea Bar be such a success, and even Cantina be such a success, yeah, it, if had if had he just gone from tsunami closes, Mike opens Mike A at Hotel Lafayette. I don't I don't know that people would have been as willing no. or ready no, to I, accept I what it is. Yeah, I agree. I, he is. You know, I think the first person that a lot of people think of when they try to think of a chef in Buffalo or like a, a, a head food figure. And, Absolutely. And so yeah, he definitely has that uh, that goodwill, I guess you could say. He understands how to please his customers and yes. make them comfortable, yeah. regardless of their creed, economic background, <laughs> yeah. desire for tequila or not. You know, like he's pretty good at understanding his customer base, even though I think it's pretty wide. Yeah. I think we covered that pretty well. I think we did too. <laughs> um, the second biggest story. Which I, I think it's they're actually probably closer than one and two as um, the food truck legislation right finally getting passed this year. We had Lloyd uh, maybe a week before they had their final meeting mm. and got the permit. So when we were talking to them, it was a lot of like if and if this happens. Since then, it's been passed. Uh, I think it's coming up for a, a renewal is. soon. Mm-hmm. But um, 
But with solid legislation for at least the city, it's prompted more food trucks to come into Buffalo. And so that's right true. now our total is 11 that yeah, we've counted. Yeah, that's a good number. Yeah, and I think it's an increase from five last year. So it, it's doubled, roughly. And I know of maybe three more that are in stages right. of coming to the streets. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's a great thing. And I think yeah. that our newest additions, Night Slider. Yeah. That's <laughs> just saying that name makes me feel dirty. <laughs> <laughs> and, um... <laughs> Night Slider and the Amy's truck. Amy's truck is huge. Which is huge because, excuse me, again, trusted brand. Yeah. Loved by vegetarians, appreciated by non-vegetarians out there slinging the lentils for everybody. (laughs) You know, it's a good thing. Yeah, it's great to see uh, somebody who's in the restaurant business see the value of of having a food truck. And others have talked about it. But they're the first one to actually... I'd really like to see that because I do think, and I will be beaten for this severely, I'm sure, in a back back alley somewhere. (laughs) But I do think that you can tell with some of the trucks that they don't have cooking or restaurant experience. Uh um, Both in how well their menu is planned and how well they execute execute their menu or how, how innovative their menu is. And I do think that having some more professionals become involved would be a great thing for the scene. Uh, yes, I um, for agree. sure. There's nothing bad about it. I mean, no. there, there's no negative side to that. Right, and it's a great way to make some <laughs> money if you're a restaurant that perhaps is seasonal. Yeah. Um, or, or you know, is uh, has slow periods during the summer where yeah. you could where you could go out and find customers. Yeah. The only thing that we should mention for sure, if we're doing a roundup is what's sort of not working for the food trucks, which is the ridiculous permit cost. That is, uh, yeah, I mean... That the trucks are paying. We're all happy that there's legislation. But it's ridiculous compared to what any other vendor pays to to sell in the city. Um, And also, of course, the fact that because Western New York has decided that it is made up of little hobbit townships instead of one large community which hobbit, i don't understand hobbit townships very very little topical hobbit townships <laughs> instead of as a community yeah there everybody has their own set of rules this is you know yeah and 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 it's really not fair to expect a truck to pay to understand the rules of every single township in yeah. in even just Erie County, yeah. and to abide by those rules, to file all the papers, it just it doesn't make sense. There needs to be an Erie County food truck permit, period. Yeah. Yes, I agree with that. Um, and I don't know how to make that happen because I don't think we can even get anybody to agree on anything in, no. at county level here. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. But I think that that's definitely needed, and I think that until that happens, the food trucks, unfortunately, are going to continue to spend money on lawyers and out there trying to get the media to support them because they're just fighting ridiculous little battles all over the place. What's yeah. happening in Amherst is insane. It's it, it's the dumbest idea there's ever. Not, there's not that much to eat in Amherst that any, that's very good anyway. So they really need some food trucks. <laughs> did I just say that? I did. Yeah, it's okay. I, I, I'll back you on that one. Okay. I work in Amherst, kind of. And I it's a struggle to find independent restaurants serving consistently good food. Amen. Amen to that. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that's a big thing that we could look forward to in 2013 is what happens to, if there's any resolution to the Amherst issue. Right. And if they do drop back the cost. I know that yes. it's been proposed to drop it well, back. Well, and we're so. almost on the end of this permit. Yeah. So that's when they're going to re- re-examine yeah, everything. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if, if that happens, I mean, you could see maybe even more food trucks. Do you, are you worried about a, uh, a saturation point? Are no. You, I never worry about a saturation point with anything, including bad pizza joints. Because the truth is, Buffalonians have money to spend on food. Even when they don't have money for anything else, they will find money to spend in the bars and at restaurants. We love it. Even in an economic crisis, it's what we do. It's how we commune as a group. Yeah. And I think that uh, we're not stupid. Yeah. If there's a better option at a better price, or even a better option at a not necessarily better price... Buffalonians are smart enough to taste that and to and to go to what's best. Yeah, and that's saturation is good because it means the really great places stick around because they're busy. Yeah, and the not so great places figure out that they're maybe not in the right business. <laughs> is there is there any cuisines you hope to hit the streets next year? What, like if you're thinking of the food truck that you want to see on the streets, yeah. what are you looking for? 
I would really love to see two things. Okay. I would love to see somebody do a poutine truck, for yeah. God's sakes. <laughs> it's such a great, easy idea. It is the easiest <laughs> idea. If you are, if you understand that you can't use powdered freaking gravy mix, yes. it's a great idea. And why someone hasn't done it, I really do not understand. I don't understand why somebody would rather sell lame Italian retreads that you can get on any corner or bar food you can get on any corner when you could be the best poutine truck in all of western new york i don't understand that and i would also like to see somebody doing really uber fresh not necessarily raw but really fresh foods whether you wrap it in a pita or whatever yeah. you know salad type stuff fresh grilled chicken like really okay. fresh 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 foods that would be happy i'm sure roswell and the larkin district oh and God, all yeah. of these sort of places and the the campuses, the school campuses, would love to have somebody serving healthy but still very good uh, food off a truck. That would be that would be great. My, the, the missing California truck is what it is. Is what we need. <laughs> my my biggest one is um, some type of halal truck. Oh yeah, or some type of um, shawarma. Shawarma in mm. general. I, I think shawarma is my third. I guess that, I think that's a good. That choice. is like such an easy idea for street food mm-hmm. and that has worked in every other major city. Right. I just I think it would kill, and uh, we definitely have a population of people who know how to cook yeah. shawarma, even though maybe they don't do it in the restaurants. But. Again, I think when you're in the city, we have access to so much stuff. Yeah, that when you're a food truck, you have to be offering something that people can't just get everywhere. Exactly. Because otherwise, why are they going to seek you out? Why are they going to stand in line? Why are they going to eat standing <coughs> up in the snow? Yeah, it has to be something that they can't go sit at the corner bar yeah. and get. Why am I driving to the east side to get a Lloyd Taco? Right. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, I mean, I guess kind of going on along with the the new cuisine, like, like an, an ethnic cuisine, like a shawarma. Sure. Um, Buffalo has seen a couple new ethnic restaurants come in, some Ethiopian places. Yes. That is, it's maybe not a huge deal because they're kind of small and, and I don't think they're as busy as I think a lot of people would like to see that food. But the idea that people are opening ethnic like Ethiopian restaurants, yes, because they think that there's a growing climate for that kind of Absolutely. food. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think that's a cool thing. I yeah. So three Ethiopian restaurants oh, we have that now. have opened in the last. Oh, where's the third one? Six months uh, on Bailey. Oh, okay. I have to so go check that out. He does a- a Ethiopian and American cuisine. I think it's called Mike's. I'm going to feel bad if that's wrong. <laughs> Actually, I, that does sound. That yeah. does sound right. Yeah. So I think it's really great. I think it's exciting. I think that. For anyone, the really tough row to hoe, per se, I sound like my grandmother now, is that um, <clears throat> is that vegetarians in Buffalo really don't eat out a lot. I agree with that, yeah. Because there's not a lot of options. I mean, 99% of the places you go, if you're a vegetarian and, like, not means, a fish-eating yeah, vegetarian. It means fish. <laughs> right. I have a vegetarian menu, Chef 999 says to me. I said, what's vegetarian on your menu? Well, we have fish. No, 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 no. So a vegetarian menu is hard to find, and places that are offering vegetarian dishes typically are offering pasta with some kind of like vegetables thrown in. It's uninventive. It's uninteresting. Yeah. And most vegetarians c- cook better than that at home. Yeah. They know how to use a lot of seasonings and a lot of flavors to, you know, sort of encourage flavor in yeah. to, into their diet <laughs> umami where the the fat or the meat might be missing yeah. and so i think that ethiopian restaurants have the challenge of being seen as a vegetarian friendly yeah. and that that's that that a lot of vegetarians who you would think would go there don't even really go out to eat they don't have a budget for going out to eat True. they spend all of their time eating at home yeah. but Ethiopian food is also gluten free, and we know yeah, that. Yeah, I didn't know that. Actually, that is until I went. huge, huge, huge. Yeah. So I think if they market more to that mm-hmm. um, than to the vegetarian side, that they'll they'll be more successful. Yeah, I ho- I hope so too. Uh, we just went to uh, how do you pronounce it? Gatours on Allen, and uh, they've definitely put a um, a good amount of money into the place. I mean, the interior looks really nice. They're Web presence is very professional. I went to the website. I was like, okay, this is an yeah, actual website. Yeah, there are a lot website. of things that have been done right <laughs> on the um, ex- outside. Yeah, looking yeah. In. But, yes. I mean, when we went there for dinner on a Friday night, there was three people there. Right. And, uh, and I mean, that s- section of Allen has been tricky. I think that it, location itself is It's has a had, tough spot to have a restaurant. Yeah, that has had three mm-hmm. restaurants. Across the street has been three restaurants. Yep. So. But I, I just, uh, I hope that people are, are into that. I, I'd like to see more 
different cuisines. I mean, I think a big, also another big ethnic thing is uh, the homestyle menu at Peking Quick One. Right. Which has developed like a cult following yes. in at least our foodie community. Certainly. That's only going to, I mean, Andrew Glarno is going to, can write about it and it's getting seen by a million people. Like, right. I, I think, uh, I would love to see more of that. I'd love to see more traditional style Chinese food. Well, or like the Burmese place. You know, like yeah, Sun. Sun. Yeah. You know, Which there's... is getting popular because it's Burmese. Right. It, it, that's like the feature point. Like, when I went to it, it was a grocery store <laughs> with uh, like some Vietnamese options and some Thai options. And like one Burmese dish yeah, on the menu. Yeah, yeah. And now they're like, wait, people want to eat the weird, right. or like the different stuff? Right. Well, and I think that that's the, again, they're one of those places that you have to really drive to if yes. you want to go there. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to happen down not, Niagara Street anytime I'm not just soon. driving down Niagara Street like I normally do. Right. And so I think, you know, that's bo- that says a lot. It says a lot about, number one, the fact that people are out there seeking new and unique food experiences. Yeah. And I think it says a lot about our food community that now people know what's happening there because t- five, ten years ago... People wanted to know what was happening. They only had one source for that, and it was the Buffalo News. Yes. And if it wasn't what what Janice was eating or, you know, whatever, then people didn't know about it. But today, with the internet and people like you working hard and Facebook pages of communities yeah. that are talking and all of the media that's available, <laughs> we can say there's a secret menu at Peking Quick One, yes. or you <laughs> should go eat Burmese food over this little place that you would never know about otherwise. Yeah. And and that's really exciting. And I think that that's part of the, the growth that's happening here um, is happening sort of everywhere because of that. Yeah. You know, the communication of finding things is a lot easier. Yeah. It's uh, it's been fun to see people get excited, to to see my Twitter feed follow up and be like, did you, did you see the the new menu at, at Sun? Like, all the Burmese... Like, people yeah. are like, getting excited over, like, these, like, what I thought was, like, niche... Oh, probably still niche cuisine. Sure. But just that p- there's, like... Uh, that there's like food nerds yes. starting. Yeah, no, it's good. <laughs> it's a whole nother level of foodie, right? <laughs> yeah, right? nerd. Yeah. Well, the, speaking of that, we should probably touch on ramen. Yeah. Because that that falls into that yeah. category too. Yeah. I mean, we we did have no no, which brought kind of ramen to to Buffalo, and um, but I mean, unfortunately, they closed. But now we have Kaidera, which isn't necessarily ramen, but they in do the have spirit. some. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Chef Tutu at uh, Kedara really has a uh, hold on a number of Asian cuisines that he's sort of fusing and doing innovative things with. And, yeah. And ramen is one of them. I've only had the chance to eat takeout from there once. I haven't gone in for we've, a full we've fledged a couple of times. meal, so I'm looking forward to that. But, <coughs> um, you know, and the Sidway's a tough building. Yeah. But now that they've opened up that block of Main Street, it's a little bit easier to park <laughs> and to find a place to. Yeah to to be to put your car so that you can go into the restaurant for a while. I think that um you know, unfortunately n- Nonu didn't live up to a lot of people's expectations, mm-hmm. people who are sort of ramen aficionados. Yeah. Um which because, I didn't know Buffalo had until I wrote about <laughs> right. Nonu and and then realized that there was a Well, the truth is is that the you know, there's two things that make ramen and amazing and it's noodles and broth. Very and true. if you don't hit both of those things, it doesn't matter. What else you put in the bowl? Yeah. If the broth and the ramen aren't, you know, top notch, then yeah. it's just not going to be acceptable to people who have any experience with the real deal. Yeah. And now, I mean, with with Toronto being ninety minutes north, and now with Momofuku, which right. is which has had mixed re- reviews, but I mean, even their ramen scene. Yeah, seems even to people be... just reading Lucky Peach, <laughs> yes, and you know, using the recipes to doctor their, you know. Black Ops ramen from the Asian food market in on Sheridan Drive or whatever. I do make a weird ramen, but it's good. People feel <laughs> like they have an understanding of what something's supposed to be, even if they've never tasted it before, which is an interesting thing. But yeah, it's, it's um, you know, definitely up to the ante for ramen in general. Yeah, uh, all over probably the country amongst foodies anyway. Yeah, and I just think that you have to hit that standard, and of course with any new business. Consistent hours and consistent yeah. service, yeah. and uh, are are absolutely one hundred percent required because the first time you say you're open mm-hmm. and I come to your restaurant and you're closed <laughs> is the last time I'll come to your restaurant yeah. unless I find out that somebody died. Yeah, and, and I, I would say the the food nerd thing. Um, I think the first time I really experienced it was when Vera was starting to open. Oh, sure, and people were like hitting me up crazy because they're ecstatic about this possible VPN pizzeria, which right. obviously it didn't turn into, but 
people were like, I was shocked that that many people cared about oh, VPN yes, pizza. intensely. And then when Nono started coming around, same thing. Like, the food nerds were, like, hitting me up, like, every day, like, is the ramen open yet? Well, like, and we that is ramen. a hard thing. And here, we've had this discussion, and we've even had it in Spree Magazine. Yeah. Using the word authentic yeah. will kick your effing ass <laughs> if you don't really, really 100% know what you're doing and source your things from as authentic yeah. a location as possible. Because there, are, we are a well-traveled community. We are no longer an insular, blue-collar, factory yeah. worker community. We are an, a community of college-educated people who travel and eat. And yeah. you can't use the word authentic if you don't really intend to adhere very strictly to that concept yeah which yeah it's just <laughs> it's, it's it's a crazy scenario it, it's I, I don't know it, it's hard for me to you know comment on on foods when i haven't had authentic. sure and uh it always makes for it interesting like we i haven't write, written up uh guitars yet right <laughs> but uh I, I mean this is my first ethiopian experience sure so it's, that's a everything, challenge everything that we have to write is always with like a you know asterisk it's honestly it's why at buffalo spray i rely so heavily on rachel fix dominguez who yeah, she's lived for so many years in asia and traveled through you know the mid-east or whatever she's she's got so much food experience hence in that her, department meme that was created yeah we had a lot of fun with that uh you know rachel fix dominguez puts the soy in sauce <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i mean she's she's amazing and the thing is is you would not know that when you meet her and she would never go out of her way to tell you about it yeah she's just not she doesn't have a big ego and being a foodie isn't her primary goal in life she's like a <laughs> into education yeah uh, the ed- child education is her th- forte but she loves to eat, and she's I've known her for years and years and years, and we're just thrilled to have her at Spree because she is able to provide commentary to readers who either want to enjoy authentic food or have enjoyed authentic food so that when she's reviewing Peking Quick One, she can tell you what is exactly like what she ate when she was in Beijing. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, this is really good compared to the taste good down the street. <laughs> <laughs> anyway <laughs> yeah but yeah so i mean i think everyone getting excited about about all these new cuisines is only good i and, agree and um you know i hope it continues through next year like i'd like to see more things i don't even i want i want cuisines to come out that i didn't even know i was missing uh, right. if somebody told me that like uh that i was missing a really like burmese food Right. It's like, oh man, this is a great city, but you really need Burmese. I'd have been like, oh, I don't know what that is. Okay, great. Right. But now it's like, all right, yeah, yeah, that yeah. Is we really need the cu- the couple things. So, that so what? Yeah. So let me I ask think we you. We really would would do well with some Nordic cuisine, which of course is Nordic. all the trend right now. With you know, um, oh my god, totally totally brain dead right now. <laughs> um, the big restaurant that's in Noma? Co- yeah, thank you, uh, <laughs> and and all of its sort of offspring. Yeah. Um, but you know, I actually my one of my first boyfriends was a Swedish exchange student, nice. and um, nice. and we um, you know, he, what he taught me about his food culture was so fascinating, and I do think that it's cuisine that would work well here because we do have chilly weather, we have similar weather patterns, yeah. um, and so I think it would be really neat to see somebody take that and do it, whether it's in a food truck and it's totally like you know, blue collar Nordic cuisine <laughs> or whether somebody decides to do a really fine dining restaurant with just tastes and samples of things like that. I just think it, it that would be really a neat thing to have here. That'd be very, I mean, that'd be pretty progressive too. Cause I think it's, so. it's still on the edge of, I think any type of even mainstream. Like, yeah. But yeah. No, but I do think 10 years from now we will find be... Nordic flavors infused in all kinds of everyday food and we will be buying Nordic ingredients out of the Nordic ingredient section at Wegmans <laughs> just like we buy British or Puerto Rican or yeah, whatever. Yeah. So yeah, I do think that's what's that's coming our way. Nice. I got to hit some up. Yeah. It's good stuff. <laughs> and no, I'm not talking about like the meatballs and lingonberry sauce at IKEA either. <laughs> Anyway. <laughs> or fermented shark. Yeah, well, I don't. I'm not a big fan of fermented uh, fish. But anyway, <laughs> um, uh, the, the another uh, trend I noticed, and we mentioned this last year on the site, was that it seems like 2012 was the explosion of cupcakes. Oh my god! In, in Buffalo. Yeah. Now we're recording this uh, only two weeks, or maybe two and a half weeks after the Cupcake Challenge. Yeah, the Nickel City Cupcake Challenge. That was fun. Yeah, it was very fun. And Allie, our, our editor and my wife, got to <laughs> got to judge the event. Yeah, she was great. Yeah. Um, 
I think that was a combination. Probably were you thinking that now is a point where we could have a cupcake challenge because there are enough cupcake places. there are enough cave cupcake places and right. and enough ones that have settled that clearly aren't going anywhere. Right, they're not going to disappear in between the time they apply and the time that we actually <laughs> have the show, which is yeah. always a a new, a uh, very nerve wracking thing for me with a chef that's new somewhere or a oh, new restaurant yeah. that applies to participate in some level as I always have to worry, like, will they be there <laughs> five months from now <laughs> when we're yeah. doing the show? Yeah, so when you do the show, it's not like, chef, this from independent consulting. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I think that the public, because of the silly cupcake wars on Food Network, yeah. the public uh, really <sighs> loves cupcakes, and cupcakes are t- so approachable because we make them in easy bake ovens when we're eight, right? Exactly. I mean, like, there's nothing hard yeah. to understand about a cupcake. But that being said, I do think that the places in town that are making innovative and exciting cupcake flavors, Zilly Cakes is really, really yeah. does that all the time. There's a lot of places that do it, um, are pushing sort of the envelope between sweet and savory, and I really love that. I like. Yeah. I think that's so much more interesting. Oh yeah, I mean, than can, a standard cupcake. <laughs> yeah, you can only have so many, you know, Nutella filled cupcakes right. that are all wonderful and they taste delicious. Well, Nutella filled cupcakes. <laughs> I feel so bad for you, Donnie. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a, a, th- a first world white white boy. Right. right no, but it's true, <laughs> and the truth is, is that you know the 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 hardest thing, and you will find this is. And I'm sure your wife would love to be having this conversation with me. <laughs> the tough thing is, is that even though cupcakes are totally approachable and all of us can bake them and any bakery can serve them because they are, you know, they have the ingredients and are already making cake probably, yeah. um, is that it's hard to get it right. Yeah. Usually the frosting, if it's made with vegetable shortening or something, or is just heavy and <laughs> dense and like the kind, like if it sits out for a little while, like it. It's yes. Like you can knock it on yes. wood. Yes. Ugh, terrible, right? Almost as bad as like a runny frosting that's all over the place. And then a lot of people, a lot of the cupcakes that I've had <sighs> for sale in retail establishments these days, the the crumb is more like a muffin. Yes. As opposed to like moist, fluffy cake. And so it's great that we have all these cupcake uh places open and i think that people have a much easier time spending two dollars on a cupcake than they have spending forty dollars on a professionally made cake yes <laughs> so i think that it's a great answer to our current economic situation for bakeries i also think that we have to like really push our bakeries to <laughs> produce products that are really yeah. amazing all the time yeah I, it's it's a shame because this year uh sarah Wally stepped down for making macaroons. I know, dagger to the heart. Yeah, and uh and we've had her on the podcast and and she's I mean, she was my first, she's my gateway into the, ma- gateway the French macaroon. <laughs> she's my gateway French macaroons <clears throat> and uh I mean, I I think that I still haven't had some that are better than what she made. And I was everyone said that like, you know, French macaroon is going to be the next cupcake. It, they can never be because a cupcake costs 5 cents to make <laughs> yeah. and anybody can make it. Yeah. A macaroon requires lots of effort, storage, yeah. all kinds of other things. I mean, there's a reason Sarah's not doing it anymore yeah. because it's really 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 hard yeah. and 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 uh people are bringing them in frozen from New York now yep. and customers are not necessarily noticing the difference <laughs> and it's a challenge how yeah. do you how do you keep up with that how do you beat that and and I was excited because I mean I'm not a huge cupcake guy I'll admit that but I was excited that people were opening up shops that were dedicated to a single thing Yes, well, you know, you and I both feel that. There could be yeah. more places that just sell one thing. I just, yeah, I just want a little shop that sells one thing. And so when I saw these cupcake places opening, and, you know, Swirls, Cupcake Orchard, Fairy Cakes, they're pretty much just a cupcake shop. Yes. And they're and they're existing as a business. They're uh, presumably doing okay. They've been open for a year or yep. so. Um, and so I was I was like, maybe maybe there's a shot that there could be just a macaroon shop right or just a place that makes like a like just ramen like right or it, it you know crossing the sweetness or maybe god willing there's a pie shop that, that Yo, just you makes, and me both babe that just makes pie and That's good it. ones all i want i know is pie. we need we need <laughs> <laughs> did you get uh did you get on ellen gedra's thanksgiving pie list no you need to you uh... gotta order like now or you won't get one she's only making 20 but yeah, so no, there's, I mean, there's very, 
few places that understand that if you do one thing and you do it really, really, really well. That's all you need. That's all you need. But at the same time, when you're imagining that one thing, <laughs> it needs to be something that has a really good profit margin. And, and, and that includes labor and cost. Yeah. And, and, and you, it can't be something that you're only making a dollar off of because then think of how many you have to sell every day. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I think that's a, that's a tough business model. And I, I would recommend anybody foolish enough to listen to this very long podcast <laughs> to go to the Small Business Development Center at Buff State, which is free. And if you have an idea, yeah. actually make a business plan that works and has profit margins built into it. Don't go, I'm the best falafel maker in town. I'm going to go open a falafel <laughs> shop and cross your fingers that at the yeah. end of the month you have enough money to pay your rent. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Anyways, well, well th- maybe next year we'll see more. Yes, any French bakery would be my friend. I mean, Elm Street Bakery is the only place where you can go, I yeah. think, um, and and uh, Delish, yeah, and get Frenchy stuff. But even <laughs> even that is not, you know, to to the nth degree yeah, of yeah. French bakery, no, and it's no. it's my number one reason to drive to Toronto all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to hit you up for your recommendation. Yeah, sure. Um, I think I think the last. Uh, the last new thing that I wanted to talk about, yes, is kind of a combo um, with with areas of Buffalo that have always been talked about. Well, okay, let's talk about Liberty Hound opening on the waterfront, sure, and the the progress that's happening on the canal right there. That that it, they're the first step, I would say. Of, they are of, of good things, and then also talking about the feel good story of Larkin. Well, I think it, what's really interesting is. You know, we'll talk about probably all of this, but it, overall, what we're seeing is the core of Buffalo, which I would say, unfortunately, is downtown Elmwood, North Buffalo area. Yes, is spreading mm-hmm. into areas that were completely unoccupied before, and now all the good food is following. Right, yeah. so we've got Liberty Hound at Canal Side, and I would imagine once there's more infrastructure at Canal Side, as far as buildings, etc., yeah. that we will see top name buffalo restaurateurs leasing or buying spaces and and having restaurants down on the waterfront. I agree with that, yeah. And then Larkin, yeah. which is, you know, amazing what they've done over there just with the Larkin building, but then you look at Larkin Square, <laughs> yeah. it is like being in another on another planet. It is not <laughs> at all like being in Buffalo. Yeah. And they're taking the risk and and showing that it, Buffalonians can appreciate I love things that are different and new if they're done well. You just have to provide them with the vision. And that place is all vision. Yeah. And the food is decent. Yeah. Uh, and they're putting a restaurant in across the street. And so I think... And they um, have the food trucks there every Wednesday yeah. in the summertime. I think it's it's got tons of potential. Yeah. Uh, that whole... And the whole drive down Seneca Street from Chef's <laughs> to where you get to Larkin. Yeah. Uh, that will, I think, fill in again uh, yeah. with lots of new businesses as time goes by. Yeah, and and so I think that both of those happening this year, um, uh, like like people not being afraid to open up a new ethnic restaurant or people not being afraid to put a hundred dollar menu item or right. something like that, um, people not being afraid to go into an area that just because it's not successful right now does not mean that you can't. Turn look at the around. future. Yeah. And if you look at what they've done with the um, <clears throat> Outer Harbor, yeah. that whole drive down Furman Boulevard, mm-hmm. and you look and you say, geez, now I know why Tucker Curtin wanted to build a restaurant out here. <laughs> you know, and why he's able this year, he's staying open year round. Oh, wow. Because it's just changed that whole perception of that area. Yeah. It's just completely different. And I just think um, it's really exciting that when now, when I think of where am I going to go have dinner. I'm not just in my head running down Elmwood or running down Hurdle or running through downtown. It's expanded. Yeah. And you could say the same of North Tonawanda and Tonawanda with yes, Smoke on yes, the Water and Remington. Well. Yeah. I mean, people slack on the burbs all the time, and, and generally rightly so. That There's not that great uh, dining options, but there's two examples of two established chefs, the, yep. the Richard Brothers and, and um, Hutch and, and Paul. Hutch and Paul. Mm-hmm. Um, that saw an area where they thought, like, listen, we could put really good food here because 
there's not a lot of really good food here. Right, and people will come for it. Yeah, yeah. And they're right. They're both places are swamped all the time. Yeah, we went to Smoke of the Water and it was packed. We had to wait like almost an hour. And yeah, was, and was... that's the how long the wait is at Remington too. Yeah. I mean, typically. So, um, I think that again, it's a, it's a, it's about restaurants wanting to not. You know, have tons of competition all on the same street, as, yeah. <laughs> and, and and we'll go where people are dying to have a good meal because we know that we can provide that for them. Yeah. But I also think it says a lot about how the average American's relationship with food has changed. I mean, arguably, in some ways, it's it's not better because we still eat a lot of hyper processed food. We still, yeah. you know, everybody's mourning Twinkies right now on Facebook. <laughs> Um, and we're not eating fresh. We're not eating local. We haven't always, we are not learning. We are not teaching our young people how to cook. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of things that are not yeah. great. Yeah, hold but what no is great is that we all have a higher expectation for flavor, for quality, for service when we're out dining. Yeah. And that that is, you know, the the sort of the right way for it to work. Because eventually, I'm hoping, people will decide that they're capable of making really great delicious fresh food for themselves at home yeah yeah and and i hope that other burbs see that there's a potential that people want a, a, a better better I just, product uh, honestly i don't I mean, I mean i'm from orchard park right which is notoriously known as one of the more wealthier suburbs and there's a lot of money in orchard park and there's two restaurants that are okay they're both a little bit more on the pricier end, but neither of the food is anything that I would brag about right. or, or go back home for. I mean... It's tough. I have lived in the city of Buffalo with the exception of two years, like 18 years ago. Yeah. I've lived in pretty much the Elmwood Village since okay. about 1992, <sighs> 93. Nice. And I um, am spoiled. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of places on Elmwood that I would not eat at that I don't think yeah. are great. But I do think that there's plenty of stuff within driving distance of me that I can pretty much have any kind of food that I'm interested in at a decent price and at a fair level of quality. Yeah. Um, I stayed for a brief period of time this last year out in Amherst for about six months, and I was horrified <laughs> at how impossible it was to find really good food that was not just uber fine dining to breeze out there. Yeah. There's a couple other really fine dining restaurants. But just to find a great burger, a great sandwich, a great whatever, it was a challenge. Yeah. A fresh, big fresh salad challenge. <laughs> like, how is that so hard? I don't understand. It's lots of little bars serving food, some diners. A red lobster that has like a three well, hour wait. And I think that's, <laughs> that's the problem. I think that when people are given the option to choose chains, which feel safe, yeah. uh, that that's a choice that a lot of people make, and that doesn't leave a lot of budget left in that community for independent restaurants. Yeah. Um, I do think that one place that's doing a nice job, actually, is Giancarlo's, okay. because it's got enough of a sort of clean vibe that it feels a little bit like a chain, like it feels really safe and clean okay. and yeah. nice yeah. inside, and the food is not a huge leap. But everything's fresh, and everything's affordable, and yeah. the service is nice, and it's lovely, and it's an independent restaurant. So it would be really great to see more people kind of figure out how to attract suburbanites and remain an independent restaurant Amen. without just serving bad, <laughs> refried, frozen fried things. I don't know. It's just bad. Just things that generally involve fried. Anything fried. Um, but yeah, so I, I that said... Going over that list of things that have happened this year and trends that have yeah, happened. Yeah, lots of movement. I feel really good about next year. Yeah, no, I, I'll be <laughs> excited to see who follows, yeah. who decides to head, take the risk down in between downtown and the Larkin District, who decides to go in on Washington District Street, who yeah. takes the leap and is the next restaurant at Canal Side. Yeah. If anybody else will join Tucker and being a year-round place out on the Outer Harbor, you know, yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's what we have to look forward to, and I think it's exciting, and I think yeah. that... We also have to look forward that hopefully some of the younger chefs that have been toiling away yeah. in kitchens under other restaurateurs will break out and open their own joints in the next year to 18 months. And yeah. I think that would be really exciting, too. That would be very exciting. Um, there also uh, has been a little bit of resurgence in Buffalo's booze scene. Sure. I talked about this with Julia, who I consider one of Buffalo's premier booze aficionados. Of course. Not a bad title to have. <laughs> um I mean, this year we saw Community Beer Works open. 
Um, great guys over there. Yeah, great, great beer. Fantastic. Yeah, just a, a great story, and uh, just some of the nicest people that we've met since mm-hmm. doing the blog too. Um, on Wilson Woodcock Brothers just opened, I think yesterday or today. Today. Yeah. And uh, Big Ditch Brewing is on their way to, to hitting the shelves. And then we have uh, Buffalo 8 Spirits, which is... Uh, right. Uh, or I think Buffalo? it's 8 Buffalo, eight Buffalo Spirits, eight Buffalo which Spirits, is hopefully yeah. going to be, you know, making booze over near the Pierce area. Yeah, which is kind of crazy because everyone thinks of home brewing, but nobody thinks of, like, how, wait, how do you make your own whiskey? Like, Right, although, you know, these micro granaries, I don't know what do you call them, micro whatever <laughs> Distilleries? Distilleries, there you go, are doing a really are really popular all over the state and, oh, yeah, and yeah. elsewhere in the country. And I think um, <clears throat> it's interesting if you look at uh, price per ounce, yeah. the difference between <laughs> being a, a brewery and yeah. be, and being a distillery. But I, I, honestly, I don't know enough about either business to be able to say <laughs> which one costs more to make. So. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not going out there. But it's cool to see, um, you know, people who are excited about these products that think like now is the time in buffalo where this could work that- well we have such an amazing brewing his- history yeah i don't know how anyone who lives in buffalo d- isn't aware of our brewing history <laughs> but if you aren't you should do some googling because yeah. it's pretty tremendous and we have all kinds of extra space and buildings that are empty, sadly. <laughs> and we have all kinds of acreage upon which to grow grain and hops yeah so it seems sort of like Natch to me that we would uh, <laughs> move towards brewing more beer here in Western New York, and, yeah. and and right now it's little the little guys that are really making great great beer, yeah. um, and hopefully someday will those will grow into to bigger breweries. Yeah, that'd be great. <clears throat> but and, and to go along with the booze, though, <laughs> um, we've seen this year. I mean, Vera opened technically in 2011, but really hit their stride. I mm-hmm. think this year. But uh, with them and what they're doing at the bar and what Tony's doing at the Mike A Lounge... Isn't Tony just an angel? Yeah, yeah. He's wonderful. Yeah. He's wonderful. And even at Sweet and Savory, you oh, and yeah. I had yeah. some really cool, innovative, yeah. interesting, freshly yeah. made cocktails yeah. when we were there. Yeah, that was also a really good experience. So I think it's basically they're raising... They're, they've raised the bar. They yeah. said, you know, Buffalo, you shouldn't be happy to have sweet and sour mix in every single <laughs> cocktail you order. Yeah. And we will give you more than a plastic cup. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. And I think that Buffalonians are happy about it. I mean, yeah. clearly, both places are, all places are swapped all the time. Exactly. And uh, it's cool to see people that are interested in the mixology element. Because um, when I went to New York City, a couple, like back in April, we went to a couple of like, speakeasies and places. Sure. And those are the coolest places to go in, in New York City. The Death and Company and Employees Only yep. and PDT. And uh, I, I was just like, I hope this like really <laughs> picks off. And at the time, Vera had been up a couple months, but uh, it just seems like everyone's down for not minding to spend a couple extra dollars to have a really good cocktail. Yes, in a cool setting. Well, it it now becomes that. Well, you know, these artisanal cocktails have so much more alcohol in them than <laughs> the three dollar cocktails that you know you get at a bar at a, at, during a Bills game I or whatever. I was that intoxicated. I can verify that. Yeah. Yes, those are. <laughs> yeah. So I think um, that the truth is is that you're getting what you pay for when you yeah. pay ten dollars for a cocktail and it is eight ounces of straight booze. <laughs> you're good. Yeah. And but what I like about it is that it's no longer like I'm here drinking forty seven you know, cheap, shitty yes. drinks yeah. to get drunk with my yeah. friends. That's Chippewa. It is, <laughs> it is, you know, I'm here with friends and we're both going to have two cocktails and we're going to sit here for a couple hours. We're yeah. going to talk and enjoy ourselves. Yes, yes. And it, it makes um, the cocktail bar sort of what the coffee house used to be, right? Yeah. So it's just, it gives people a place to be, uh, a third place, as they say. Yeah. A place to be, a place to hang out, a place to feel at home, and what I like uh, specifically about Tony's place, uh, Mike A's Lounge, and Vera, is that I use them both very differently. <laughs> I go to Vera if I'm by myself or with one other person, and I want to hang out with the bartender, yeah. and I want to like chat and and be friendly and whatever, and have cocktails and all that stuff. Yeah, I go to Tony's place 
if I'm with a big group of people and we need room to move around and we want to talk and hang out, but we still want to have really good drinks. And that's what you get at my case. You're not, the bartender is not going to be interjecting into your conversation, no. <laughs> which, you know, you can want or not yeah, want. Exactly, if you, yeah. They're two different experiences. They're different and vibes, I, yeah. I love both of them and I use them both for very different reasons. Yeah. And I, I couldn't be happier that, that we have both of those. And I agree. When, when my, my best friend who lives in New York City has come to Buffalo now, I'm excited to show him Vera, hmm. and in my case, because you know he's he's happy because he's from Buffalo, and he's he's happy that we have this these yeah. options now, and, and I would love to see more of that. I don't know where I want to see more of that. I mean, uh, I, like again, I'm from Orchard Park. Like I don't understand why there's not a really good lounge. Right, and there. the, there's the money to yeah. support it there, yeah, or even in the North Towns in <clears throat> Williamsville or whatever. It, it's just. Uh, but I, I, I look forward to seeing what they do. Like, this last year was both... I mean, it was... It, it, Tony had a little bit less time. But both of them were figuring out what they were doing. They were right, and who their down. customer was yeah. and all of that. And I think, like, maybe future things of, like, well, maybe now we can start trying to do some oak age drinks. And, right. And experimenting with the craft and all that stuff. I'm looking forward to see... Now that they're comfortable, what they're going to do next? Year. Yeah, well, I think both places are already changing the game up and doing new things. So yeah, yeah, no, it's it's really cool, and I hope that we see more fine dining restaurants start taking their cocktail menu seriously. Yeah, okay, and and whether that means just doing classics correctly or it means being innovative, I don't care either one. Yeah, yeah, I don't um, need a centrifuge. I just want a really good drink. <laughs> I don't have to have the big square ice cube. <laughs> But I would still like a really good Manhattan. So yes. I think, you know, whether <clears throat> that's the case. And then I'd like to see a couple other bars understand the finer points of choosing to stop being <laughs> swill houses and start being <laughs> cocktail yeah. microbrew type. I, I love the name swill house. We have so many bars in this town. <laughs> like, j- just decide that you want to be new and different and, yeah. and treat people well and have comfortable seating and... Yeah. Have a l- really light little tiny menu. Yeah. Don't try to be a restaurant. Yes. It would be great. Yes, I definitely agree. Because we can't go to my gaze and, and Vera every. Well, <laughs> I would like some variety. But. All right. But, <laughs> oh, that might be hard. I think we should also uh, touch on a couple of the unfortunate closings that have okay. happened this year. Um, so I, I went on Urban Spoon. And there's a feature where you can see all the restaurants that have been added to the, the yes. website. So I was looking through to find out new ones that have come up. And there's right. a lot I of, use that all the time, There's actually. a lot of restaurants that have opened this year. Yes. And we talked about maybe uh, six. And that's, I think, as many as we need to talk about. Right. But there's like <laughs> 50. Yeah, it's yeah. It's just yeah. that most of them are serving fish fries and, and a lot frozen of hamburgers. Pizza. A lot of pizza. And pizza. <laughs> um, but then there's also a closings. And again, I, same thing. A lot of places that are closed that like a dude was like, hey, uh, I got laid off of my job, but I've always wanted to open a pizzeria. Right. A lot of those. I, I'm assuming. That's those, or he or he opened a food truck. Either <laughs> one. <laughs> yes. Um, so what I looked, though, I looked for the closings that were like restaurants that I, I've enjoyed eating at and that might genuinely be really missed. And so... Um, I'll just run through the, the list and we'll go okay. over them. Um, the ones that I picked out, Prime 490 over on Rhode Island. Uh, Fiamma Steak on Hurdle. No, no, we already talked about. Right. Uh, O'Brien's uh, Smokehouse and, I believe, Steakhouse? I don't know if that was the full title. Yeah, smo- smokehouse and Meat Shop or something That's like that. That's what it was, yes. And that was in, in Hamburg. Hamburg. Yeah, yeah, right on Main Street. Uh, Le Metro, which was in the Tony Walker Plaza. Which... Right, and was the second Le Metro. The first one was where... Oh, really? Mode is now. Oh, well, no the FC, which has been empty for two years. But yeah, yeah that's where the first Lametro was. Oh, I had no idea. And then Chow Chocolate, which I right. think maybe might have closed longer ago, but I, I actually don't know. Well, it, the one on Elmwood recently closed. Yes, and the one on, on Main, Main Street, Street closed, I think, a while ago. Yeah, yeah because Block Club <laughs> is located there now. Yes, yeah. Um, so, what or how do you want to talk about this? So, <laughs> um,. <laughs> I guess we'll start at the beginning. I, I was upset when I found out Prime 490 closed. We went there for a local restaurant week a while ago. Maybe maybe my first restaurant week. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had a genuinely really nice meal. And I was oh, that's good. And I was shocked when we went in how nice the place looked on the inside. It's it's 
really they tried their best to do a really nice modern clean yeah job with it and and when i heard that it's closed i mean we only ate there once and, and that's kind of a, a unique thing that we have that we really you can't go there more than I once because yeah. you have too many places yeah. to review and uh and i don't think we were in a rush <clears throat> to go back there to revisit it but i i always liked knowing that that street rhode island had a couple dining options right so with left bank there um essex street which i guess is now serving food I didn't know that. Yes. <laughs> uh, they have a, a full menu. Uh, Annie from Peapod Riot just wrote up a huge... Uh, I'll have to um, check that ...a big out. post about it. Um, and then Five Points, which is down the street, which sure. is fantastic. I think that um, the... Pro- from the outside looking in, I've eaten at Prime Four ninety six 96 times, maybe. Oh, okay. Okay. So, on the from the outside looking in, I think that Prime Four ninety had an identity crisis. Okay. I think that <clears throat> when it first opened, it was a steakhouse... It was charging really high high prices. Okay. It opened at the same time Fiamma opened and other steakhouses uh-huh. opened. And I think that there were some points that didn't really hit home with the visitors, uh-huh. with the guests, that they could find elsewhere at the Chop House or, yeah. you know, wherever. Yeah. And so it's been sort of, it's kind of, then it was Italian for a little while. It's kind of I all see. over the place. Okay. And I think that that that's hard for a customer. A customer wants to know what you do. They may reject it, mm-hmm. but they need to understand what you offer before they even walk in the door. When they're Googling yeah. you, when they're looking at your reviews, your website. And that, that's probably even more of a case of a restaurant that's located on a street where you are going out of your way yes, to go to that restaurant. Yes, a destination restaurant. restaurant. Yeah. Right. There's nobody who's just happened to drive down Rhode Island and was like, oh, let's go there tonight. Well, you would think that just the overflow from Left Bank would be possibly enough <laughs> yeah, to keep people, them open. People who don't want to wait Left two hours. Bank is full all the time. Left all Bank, the time. Left Bank and Pano's are the two restaurants that I just would love to see. <laughs> I, this is the accountant in me. Just love to see the financial figures right. that are coming out. and Because I am shocked every time I go by either of those places that it is always I, I I agree with you, <laughs> but I think that um, I think that whoever buys the Prime Four Ninety building has the opportunity to really kick some serious ass yeah, because it, yeah. it's in decent shape. It's it's not you know it it's had a lot of work done to yeah. it. The kitchen is of reasonable size. I mean, and it's it's approachable. It's a nice building, and because Left Bank is there and because Five Points are there. You don't go, oh, I'm driving to the west side. This is so scary. You know, it's really like everybody's been there. It's yeah. no big deal. Yeah. So I think that if somebody comes in there and they have a vision mm-hmm. and and they understand how to properly promote and maintain yeah. the marketing aspect of their business and they do a really good job with the food and the service, they could do really well. I don't think the location was the problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, Fiamma, uh, we had... Uh, two kind of mixed experiences. We went, again, for local restaurant week and had a really bad service experience. Mm. Um, we wrote about it and we didn't, We it was just horrible. Like, our, mm-hmm. our service appeared for, I think, 45 minutes before our food came out. And yeah. All these things. Uh, we went back again right, actually, probably before they closed and had an alright meal. No, nothing to write home about, but I think we had, like, a free gift card, so we weren't too mm-hmm. upset about it. It wasn't like I spent... Right, two hundred dollars, and then yeah, right. Um, but when we started Buffalo Eats, it was the one name that always kept jumping out that people would recommend to us. Yeah, no, I when they were young, I used to love it there. Yeah. I loved the sides. I liked how they had done a really good job with the yeah. interior, feeling like it was modern. Yeah. Which was, and by the way, it's, it's a, this uh, currently it says that they're temporary closed. Right. But it's they've been temporary closed for a couple months now. I think now. they put on their Facebook page that if people had gift cards and stuff that they would extend them yes. once they reopened. Yes. But So with all we hope that I, they get on their feet and that they become what they want to Whatever were. or whatever it is they want to be. I yes. mean maybe they're gonna totally re envision the place. Yes. Maybe it won't be a steakhouse so, at all. So this we have to say though, this is And with Noel an the chef is very talented guy. Yeah. So uh, you know, there's an opportunity for yeah. it to be great. But I think that but, clearly it had just slid. Yes. And I don't know if that was because somebody let it slide or because things happened that forced it to slide. Yeah. Whatever the case is, it slid. It wasn't what it was. And and the and the world has moved on and now has higher expectations and wants different things. Yes. And, you know, I mean, honestly, Hurdle's a tough street to have a restaurant on. <laughs> yeah. We think of it as restaurant row in many ways because there are so many buildings that can be or have been restaurants. 
Hmm. But I'm going to go out on a limb here and say <laughs> that if you're not at Lombardo's or Joe's Deli or Taste of Thai, yeah. it's a challenge to get a good meal on Hurdle Avenue. I would, I would agree with that. A challenge. And yeah. I've and Bertha's, tried. Bertha's as well. Bertha's the diner, yes. right. I I mean, it's 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 hard. Yes, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Because me and Ali always joke about how, oh, we haven't even touched the surface of Hurdle. And then we'll drive down, and we'll be like, no, I think we're pretty good, except for Lombardo's. That's really the only one we have to hit. Yeah, I mean, it's... Also, it, Shifts Kebab Express, I have to say, is... is oh, yes, I agree with you. Yeah, it's the best $4 you can spend in a restaurant. Uh, that's true. I guess I'm thinking of more of all the no, old, but who would, yeah. Italian places and lounges yes. that offer food. I agree. It's just, it's, yeah. I agree. So, that's a shame. Hopefully they they work their thing out. No, no, we already talked about it. I don't think yeah, there's really anything else we gotta. Right. O'Brien's is is um, is sad because we went there the day after the Nickel City Chef. Okay. And uh, and and amazing beef. Yeah, great beef. Amazing beef. Um, really, really affordable prices. Like just like for what you're paying for. I thought we were. You know, it more was, than it was happy. A, yeah, more than happy. And uh, and I think that you know, there's their Eden restaurant. Yeah, so, yes, we should pub, say that they Eden closed Hamburg. Yes, but yeah, they're down but the really like innovative, mm-hmm. fresh, young Hamburg yeah. butchery slash burger steak joint. Yeah, just an awesome idea is 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 done. I'm I'm interested to see what'll go in there. But I'm sad. I'm really sad to see O'Brien's go because I think you and I both agree that had that shop been anywhere in the city. Yes. They would have been busy out the door yes. all the time I with agree. people not only buying fresh local meat, but yeah. also with people there having dinner. And and I think like properly designed, that is something that would also be an amazing location on like the theater district. Oh yeah, or somewhere where like somebody wants to have a nice quiet sit down dinner, but have that whole type of look and feel. Like I, like you said, I mean, this is a total like Brooklyn idea. Like I can just it see, is. I can see, I see this image of this Brooklyn restaurant with. The meats and the butcher and everything, and then right. also getting served like the best steak. And yeah, stuff. no, and I think that that it could have worked had it not been in Hamburg. Yeah, it's a it's a bummer. It is, but, I'm but sad. like like you said, they are available in Eden. Unfortunately, I don't yes. go to Eden that often. I don't either, <laughs> except for the Corn Festival, and that's only begrudgingly with Allie. But right, <laughs> the uh. one other place that we didn't talk about is that Cozumel closed. Oh, I see. And I didn't know if it was officially closed. It's all over their Facebook page. Okay, so well, I'm assuming closed. that they've yes. closed. And um, Although people have been talking about it for over a year. A year yeah, ago, somebody yeah. came to me and said, you know, yeah. did you hear Cozumel is closing? And I was like, <laughs> no, but we'll wait and see. Yeah. I mean, living in Allentown, it's a pretty big spot to go in the summertime because their patio is gigantic. Yep. yep. I can't say I've ever had a great food experience there. It was when they first opened. When okay. they first opened, it was like, oh, Mexican food, yay! In the city of Buffalo. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that was 20 years ago. Okay. <laughs> but I'm guessing Do you that- think, like, Mike A's is almost a... Pre- or, not Mike A's, Cantina Loco is a, is a pretty big factor for that or do I you don't think? I don't because I think that the people who who go if you drive past Cantina Loco at they're very six di- o'clock <laughs> on a Tuesday night they're very different and crowds. it's packed it's a totally different crowd than anything <laughs> that was ever at Cozumel and I am sure that plenty of people had wonderful Cozumel oh yeah I know people who like that loved it when I worked uh, downtown uh our department they would love to go to Cozumel well, lunch it's, break I uh, here's the thing it's got so much parking yeah I think that I'm really hoping that it doesn't stay empty for long, no. but I am guessing that whoever goes in there is going to have to gut the hell out of the place. It was very weirdly... It's strained. The format, the floor plan yeah, is the weird. Fl- yeah, the floor plan is and crazy. Every, it's beer soaked. Yeah. Like, that whole place yes. is beer soaked. A lot of sticky floors. Lo- yeah, and probably <laughs> subfloors. So, I think, you know, in the bathrooms and everything else, I think somebody's going to yeah. have to really have some dinero. Yeah. But it shit. is prime real estate. I mean, that could be... And, well, yeah, and with parking yeah. in Allentown. <laughs> what the hell? That doesn't happen. Yeah, so I totally forgot about Cosmo, but yeah, that, I mean. What so, do you, so just out of curiosity, since you're an Allentown denizen, yes. what would you, what, what would you like want to see in a space that big that's clearly meant for lots of, lots of people to be at? I think that patio is going to determine what that restaurant mm-hmm. becomes, and it's never going to be maybe something that I want to go to. Okay, I that's think fair. Th- I think that restaurant, the way it's built now, if somebody went in there and didn't want to spend a lot of money, will be a sports bar or something like that. Ugh. And that is not at all in- 
entertaining to me at all. Yeah. Like, I mean, I if I'm going to watch a sporting event, I'll watch it Allentown here. Allentown has plenty of dirty bars. Yes. And we don't so, really need another one. I mean, ideally, like, uh, I don't know. I would love a, a, a bar that is chill. I... I like uh, the the atmosphere of Cantina Loco is fantastic. Yes. Except if you try to go there on a drink on it's a Friday so or Saturday, crowded. I don't have the patience. I only go if it's five o'clock. Exactly. In the afternoon. But I would love another one of those. We have so many divey bars here. It'd be nice to have a place that, that I, is clean. That I, and, and, and this fun. is totally a a really specific problem to myself. But just so that I don't have to drive to Mike A's or Vera. Right. And then you make would like sure... something that's really nice that you can watch. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, Donnie, we'll just conjure that right up for you. <laughs> but, but, I mean, I think there's a, a growing population in Allentown, and, and there's right. definitely a lot of people in walking distance that would like something different. But, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, I, perfect scenario, uh, just a simple little ramen shop that I could just go, <laughs> and at 10 o'clock... Ramen shop with cocktails. <laughs> yes. Walking distance from Donnie Burtless's house. <laughs> We would never see you again. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I want. I just want somewhere I can get like a bowl of noodles uh, at 10 a.m. on a Saturday when I have a headache. All right. To make up from what you consumed yes. the night before. Yeah. Got yeah. it. But yeah. All right. no, I, I don't know. I, I, I would love to see that become something nice and something mm-hmm. elevated and bring new cuisines or new drinks. Uh, but I don't have You don't any. expect it. I don't. I just think with that patio, that patio screams... Bucket of Bud Light. Yeah, you're. <laughs> <laughs> the patio screams. There's the big vinyl sign that says "Bucket of Coronas, yeah. five dollars." Yeah, you're right. You're right. It's so sad. <laughs> but I guess you know we have all these college students. They have to have somewhere to go. Yeah, right. It's not like we have three different streets dedicated to drinking. I know Tom Burtless would be anywhere with a bucket of of Corona for five dollars. <laughs> Um, uh, so <laughs> that leaves us at Cosmo. Uh, Le Metro, right? Uh, closed. The Tony Walker Center has had some crazy changes. Well, they've decided they're taking over the whole center. They're re- they're yes. taking back all the leases. Yes, and they're building their own little yes Tony Walker world there. Yeah, Tony including Walker even world. the Tim Hortons is. Wow. Yeah. So, so yeah. So yeah. So Le Metro is done. Yeah, and. And what we talked about before this started, we went to the Metro last year, and or maybe even this year, I don't even know. Um, it's all just a blur of restaurants yes, at this I'm point. Yes, I'm sure. And we didn't have a good meal at all. Uh, I mean, we had parts of it that was good. We had we had some dishes that we liked more than others, but generally, um, we didn't really like the food that much. And the atmosphere at that place, this is going to be totally generalizing, uh, is not our scene at all. Mm. Uh, I... The vibe and the the restaurant clientele, it just... It was bringing back to all the flashbacks of what I did not like about Orchard Park. Right. And the the people and, and things That's like that. That's not the way the first... You know, I have a huge, big spot in my heart for the first La Metro, which was on West Utica in yes. Elmwood. And, you know, they brought bench bread making, yeah. which is like a term, okay. to Buffalo, where you could get, like, real bread. And they were making sandwiches on the real bread that were fantastic and what I would consider gourmet. And having moved here from Seattle, the land of gourmet sandwiches and gourmet (laughs) coffee and gourmet whatever at the time, which the word gourmet is so passe now, but whatever. (laughs) When I moved here, I was like, oh my God, everything comes on a freaking sub roll with oil. What the (laughs) hell is going on in this place? I was so perplexed by the sandwich choices available when the metro opened and i could get great bread and i could get a great fresh sandwich stacked with veggies and high quality cheeses and meats and all that kind of stuff and no oil i was extremely excited and i loved the metro and i loved that the type of sort of uh french but not overly french yeah. food that you could get in the fine dining side of its restaurant and i was really 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 sad when they closed um on Elmwood, but I think yeah. that th- that again, that had been a restaurant that had been slipping from its goal and its vision, I see. and had kind of like veered way off to the side. Yeah, and and I was actually surprised to learn last year that the one 
in Williamsville was still open because I thought that when the one on Elmwood closed, that the one in Williamsville closed as well. Yeah, we had been hearing a lot of rumors for a while before we visited. And that, you know, that restaurant was started by the folks who started Left Bank. Like, people who really, great restaurant people with great vision, lots of experience, lots of passion. And so it's been hard to see that sort of fritter away and change and mutate. But I guess that's what happens over time with all restaurants, especially restaurants that are built on partnerships between people who are not necessarily married or family exactly um but you know mora is now at uh yeah, coco and she owns soleil on yes. elmwood so you know she's, at, at coco, she's busy yeah at coco if you look at their menu it's it's not that different than what it is metro so i mean people who but it's still, a really different vibe yeah inside it's much less yeah. it's much more cafe it's way more I don't want to say bohemian. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's but that's sort of <laughs> yeah, what I was thinking but, too. But uh, it's uh, compared to the uh, I'm just gonna say trophy wife vibe <laughs> that I got at the See, it's, Tony Walker I've Center. I've never been. Well, that's I, think, I mean, first of all, I'm in the Tony Walker Center. Right, I, think I know where that I'm that at. That has more to do with the location <laughs> than the, the yeah. than the vision of the restaurant yeah. owner. But um, and that's just like a stupid thing that just annoys me. It's not their fault, but it's uh, <laughs> but so uh, people who really enjoyed, I guess, that food still like up until their days of closing. I guess you could probably still get a lot of those similar cuisines right. at the Coco location. You're just not going to get any of the same atmosphere that right. was there. But so yeah, we should probably mention that yeah that Coco's <laughs> that Coco's open at at uh, the former Eight's Eight, location. Yeah, eight eighty eight Main Street. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I like it, what it was, she's done with the space too. I like the big yeah. paintings. I like that the it's darker and warmer inside. I like it. We haven't checked it out yet. I mean, I've always loved that location. We went to Camp Perry's Pizza, yeah, which closed. Then we went to the Eights, and we really liked that. Yeah, unfortunately, that the, the Eights was beautiful. Yeah, but I think that uh, you know, Morris definitely made the space her own. I was only I have not been there for dinner. I've tried to go a couple times, but I just things keep coming up, and I've not been able to go. I went um, and had beers with james roberts at like 12 30 in the afternoon there once <laughs> and it was it's really the it's a really warm warm vibe nice well, i look forward to trying it out um but i think that that pretty much sums it i mean also chow chocolate uh closed. right we should talk about that. yeah and um for a town that's known for chocolate and sponge candy uh we're known for pretty much milk chocolate like Fowler's. Yeah, and, I think and, we're. And, I mean, we're not known. I mean, but when people hear, we have a lot of candy shops in Buffalo, yes. and we had even more before. Okay. And I give props to any candy independent candy shop that can make it work because it's an expensive business to be in. Yeah. Your food is perishable. Your costs are expensive. It's all very labor intensive. Like I think anybody who can make a candy shop work that's not just selling you know can- candy that's mass manufactured. Yeah. Is a it's it's a really hard thing to do. I loved Chow Chocolate. Because, again, we all know I love things that are French. <laughs> and Chow Chocolate really had a very European yeah. flair for what they were doing. Both the size of the candy, the appearance of the candy, and also its flavor profiles. I loved their candy. Um, and I am very, very, very sad to see them go. Yeah. And I think that we are, our city lost something. To see them and Sarah yeah. You know, both stop what they're doing in the same year is just soul crushing to anyone who loves European <laughs> sweets at all. But I think um, it's a tough business to be in. I can't, only, and, I can't only and, imagine. You know, to go from being an artisan food maker, doing things on a certain level, to being a brick and mortar business is a huge leap. Yeah. And trying, again, trying to make those profits work with the co- the Yeah, it's just really hard. Yeah. I mean, we. When we, one of the last times we went to the uh, farmers market on Bidwell, mm-hmm. we saw that they had a stand. So I don't know if they're going to continue. Hopefully, yeah, they've had. I mean, that's how they started. Yeah, their so business I, started I would, at farmers. I hope so, so. But I mean, that is an extremely limited way to get their their food, if, right? Which if, is why they went brick and mortar because yeah. they could only. First of all, they they couldn't really do the chocolate the way they wanted to because it melts outside in the summertime. Yeah, I can't imagine. And you know. You, farmer's market business is only a five month a year business and it's a challenging business because you think you're hauling all your stuff yeah. in, hauling all your stuff out and a lot of the busy markets happen on the exact same day so you have to be in multiple places it's a it's a tough business to be in if that's your yeah you know the bulk of of what you do which i'm imagining is why they transitioned into brick and mortar but i just 
it's uh, it's tough. They went to Main Street, and I'm imagining the reason why they left Main Street is because they felt that foot traffic was the issue. Yeah. So then they came <clears> to <throat> Elmwood, hoping that foot traffic wouldn't be the issue, and it was still an issue for them. Yeah. So, and Elmwood's just, notorious for leases and costs and things like sure. that as well. So I just think it's tough. If you look at the people who make chocolate and make a lot of money making chocolate in Western New York, they're either number one, selling crappy chocolate <laughs> for cheap and people don't care and don't know the difference. Yeah. They're number two, have a huge uh, wholesale business yes. where they are reselling their product yeah, like uh, like Chocologo. Even Fowler's and those, I mean, Truffalo's you can buy all over in all over Western New York. They're not only available at, you know, the one yeah. chain of candy shops. So I think that that's really the only way probably to make it work unless you are an add-on to a bakery or a sandwich shop or something else. And yeah. I know that that's what the Main Street location tried to do. It tried to have baked goods. It tried to have coffee. It tried yeah. to have breakfast. I think I had lunch there. Actually. Yeah, I had <laughs> breakfast there once. But there was not enough consistent yeah. business to maintain a chef of this, of that, or whatever. Yeah. So it's just tough. Yeah, it's a bummer because they, they were doing good things. They they. You know, a lot of places you could say closed because it just wasn't that good anymore. Yeah. But there, there just wasn't the case. The, nope. Their food was still, or their chocolates were just as good as. Oh, their chocolate's amazing. The and best, the baked the goods best hot, amazing. And the best hot chocolate yep. I've ever had in my entire life. Yeah, no, I remember they, having like a, the first sip and I was like, this is it. They definitely know what they're, what they're doing and yeah. I hope that we see some version of at least their knowledge base, even if they just act as consultants for someone else, that we yeah. see what they can do somewhere else again. Because yeah. to think that we lost that European flair, it's just so sad. It is. All right, well, let's stop talking about sad things. Okay. I think that runs No up. more sad stuff. Yeah. Um, let's talk about some of the events that have been happening this year and some of the, for the most part, that you are responsible for. No, 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 <laughs> Let's no, talk no. about you for the last hour of this. No, um... No, let's no. not do that. <laughs> let's, let's first talk about... Um, <laughs> let's first talk about the... Buffalo's new underground dining club. Omakase. Omakase. Which, if anyone's interested, it's omakasebuffalo.com, I believe? Yes. Okay. O-M-A-K-A-S-E buffalo.com. Yes. And that's where you can sign up and, and you get randomly selected to participate in a dinner. Right. You have to wait and get an invitation. Yes. And then you have to respond, I guess, in a certain number of days so that they can... I believe 48 hours. So they can give your invitation to somebody else if you don't use it. Yes. And uh, you don't, you do not learn of the location of the event until I believe like twelve hours or twenty four hours before. Right, and you don't know what you're eating, and, and that's because it's not always in a licensed facility. Yes, yes. It's not always in a place that has a license. It's an it's a legitimate underground dining experience, yes. and so they're protecting their interests and the interests of the place where they're having the dinner. Yes, by keeping things on the DL. Yeah, so. Uh, We've both posted pictures of the first dinner. Yeah. So we can both confirm that we were there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, um, when I posted the pictures of that first dinner, and I think that was one of the biggest events this year where I've posted like a gallery of photos mm -hmm. and my inbox, my inbox blew up. Mm. Um, probably th within the first 24 hours, we had 75 requests. Of people ask me how they could get to wow. eat at one of these dinners. Yeah, that's cool. And I was shocked. I thought people were going to think that it was cool, like that I was taking pictures of stuff, and like I was like, "Oh, those are really nice pictures." Like I was expecting just likes, likes. lots mm -hmm. of likes, but I got a lot of feedback from that, and I was shocked. I I, I didn't think that. Um, I mean, seventy five is a small number, but compared to what normally we get, sure. active. I was shocked that that many people were interested. In it. I think the people. Um, I think that people are always looking for something new and exciting, especially hardcore foodies, which would obviously be following you on Facebook. Yes. Because <laughs> if you're a hardcore foodie and you're not following Buffalo Eats on Facebook, you're totally insane. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and I think that, uh, that the element of suspense and excitement is inherent in anything that's secret, right? Very so, true, yeah. Um, it's definitely appealing on, on that level. Yeah. Um, but what I think is interesting is that you had told me um, 
offhandedly that someone had asked you if like the chef was legit and if it was safe and if they should be worried and all this other stuff <laughs> and i just thought it was so funny because it's so well executed yeah and it's it's so well orchestrated like, and the look food at the is picture. so impeccable <laughs> look at the pictures of the first meal it's like hysterical to me that somebody would think that we're all like promoting somebody serving food out of a johnny on the spot yeah. somewhere yeah. you know no, like, trust me <laughs> he makes great chicken finger subs out of the trunk of his car <laughs> (laughs) right that's right and it's so not that it's so so tight and so legitimate that i I think it's uh that actually really just cracked me up completely yeah i was shocked i was shocked when i got that that uh so the people just need to trust and we've all wasted 40 or 50 dollars on something way more stupid than that before yeah this is extremely affordable for the products that you've that you that i've had at the The last experience that you have yeah yeah the experience alone too but the food i mean but it's tough because they only do them you know once every three months or something yeah you know, sometimes it it's like only it. 12 people and sometimes it's 40 people. Yes. And so if you want in, you better write, I will say, you'd better write a really good statement when yes. it says, why do you want, why exactly. do you think you should you be invited or why do you want to be expi- and- invited? You should really fill that out. Yes, try to impress the uh, organizers here. I've had two people tell me that they've applied, but then they didn't fill in the box, and uh, none of them have gotten invited to anything. And so I'm thinking that might have something to do with it. That's That sounds like it might be the case. Yeah, but we, it's cool. It shows yeah. you how much our scene is growing. I mean, our the restaurant scene here, the scene of people who are plugged in and excited about food and, yeah. and beverages and dining experiences and sharing those experiences with other people is 20 times what it was when I first started all of this. That's awesome. So. It was it was cool because the last one we went to, the, the second dinner. Yeah. Um, my friend happened to also get an invite. And this is totally not, he, nobody knew he was my friend. It was right. a great circumstance. And uh, he was texting me almost every day. So excited that he was <laughs> going awesome. to go to this thing. And uh, he was like, he's like, have you heard anything about what they're going to serve? And he was just so excited. And, like, the day of, he's, like, texting me, like, I can't wait. And, I, I like, and he's a reasonable foodie, but still somebody who's not in the food industry crowd right. or in our circle of people that we all know. And uh, it was just so cool to see somebody who gets that excited over food. And was he that excited after the experience? Yeah, he, he still thinks it was the best meal oh, he's had. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, he was, he was just, like, floored. That's but, awesome. I mean... F- uh, the food was fantastic, and that fried chicken that we had was the best fried chicken I've yeah, ever had. Yeah, fuck you, Donnie Burley. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, so yeah, that, I think that is a huge thing. That uh, Even if it becomes a quarterly event next year, or right. whatever, whatever they want to do with morphs it. morphs into. Um, it means a lot. It means a lot that that, S- that exists. Sold out, yeah. functioning, tasty, yeah. meeting everyone's expectations. yeah. yeah. More, please. Yes, and uh, and hopefully other chefs maybe see that and pull their own do whatever, whatever they want to do. Yeah, I want to see pop ups. Yes, okay. I was I talked to friends in New York. I say pop up. They're like fuck pop up. up. We hear pop up all the time. No, 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 no. <laughs> we don't have any pop up action happening here except for what Ross Warhol yeah. did yeah. at the Anthony in the summer. There should be pop-ups all the time. Yes. 90% of Buffalo's restaurants are closed on Sunday and or Monday. There is no reason why we are not doing pop-ups in each other's restaurants. Te- there is no reason why we are not getting crazy groups of chefs yes. that are friends together to cook crazy awesome meals yes. in existing restaurants that open for one day. Come on, people. <laughs> Teddy Bryan was here, and he hinted... Loves me some Teddy. Yeah, and he, <laughs> he hinted at a potential... I am aware and I and of a pop up with Lloyd Taco Truck. Yes. And I like almost shook him down uh-huh. and made him tell me if this was really happening. <laughs> and uh but no, I I would love to see that in, in, and I, I can only imagine that it will. I mean, well, and Roaming Buffalo did it by having Amelia Nussbaumer on their yes, truck they did, and they having the, Kevin O'Connell on their truck. Yeah, that was a great there idea. Are I would a love thousand to see. ways to make yes. this happen without having to rent tables and chairs and plates and going yeah. bananas because i understand as an event promoter that my biggest expenses after labor are rentals yeah. the space rental the chair rental the table rental the t- uh, it's endless you can you can have a hundred dollar price come in the door per head and you can spend fifty dollars of it just on getting everybody enough glasses and silverware yeah. to, you know like it's insane so why aren't we doing this in existing businesses? Why aren't we talking to the people at Larkin or the people at the Albright yes. or the people at Birchfield and saying, can I do a pop-up in your restaurant? I mean, it just has to happen. Get on the stick, people. 
<laughs> that that would be that'd be huge. And it needs to happen. Yes. All right. Fingers crossed that when we come back here at the end of 2013, we talk about at? all the great pop up restaurants that we and how we this never year. want to hear the word pop up again. <laughs> we can oh, tell New York so over pop ups and pork oh, belly. No more bacon covered donuts for Christ's <laughs> sakes. <laughs> Oh, uh, I think the other big event that we should talk about is, and we are going to talk about you here, is the in event that was created, the uh, biweekly Monday night event at Sea Bar. Yep, um, that is meant to kind of bring together all the industry people, but also you know people who are just interested in it's food open in to the general public. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it's called in, which stands for industry night, but we also think of as being the in, as in crowd, yes. which we joke about because. It's open to everyone. Yeah. There's absolutely no yeah. snobbery no, brought, associated at all. No, no. I've brought uh, outsider, outsider civilians, if you will. Right. And, uh, I may be a food snob, <laughs> but when it comes to people, as far as I'm concerned, the whole world's invited. Yeah. I don't like to play those games where it's like, just me and these three people and you yeah. can't be over here. Like, yeah. I... I was picked on at school. Maybe that's what it was. <laughs> but I that whole clicky thing, I'm not down with. So no. the in crowd is sort of tongue in cheek but it's really it's everybody yeah and uh it has given me something to look forward to every other Monday oh that's awesome well uh, that's exactly what we wanted it to do I uh I, lo- I love it I, I've been to everyone I think yes. yeah I think you have too yeah and um they're, they're really fun I mean besides the fact that for me I get to hang out with people that I've known this year which yes. is crazy in itself that I know these people but it's it's fun that I get to do this and and um, I understand the appeal for me because you know I'm hanging out with friends so to right. speak but I've brought outsiders and they've had a blast they have had, enjoyed drinking at Sea Bar which is a gorgeous bar and just a great sure, place to hang it's out it's a great place and they've also enjoyed the theme every week and so well, they get you. to taste a little of uh, some ham some uh, Hamon. Yeah, hamon. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and, and all, and cocktails that so we, are being made. We and, should tell listeners that the basic concept of Inn is that yes. it is an industry night on Monday nights. It's okay. free. It runs from 9 to midnight, and it's every other Monday. Yes. And it's uh, basically an opportunity for restaurant people to hang out together. But it's not... Your regular industry night is basically like, bring your paycheck stub and we'll give you 20% off Coors Light. <laughs> it's not like that. It's The idea is... That um, although I see Tom back there is angling for the twenty percent, of course, like, but uh, I think that um, <laughs> I think that the goal of it is to actually um, unite the restaurant industry because restaurant people all work so hard; they very rarely actually socialize in between restaurants. So we yeah. wanted everyone to feel like they were part of the scene and that they didn't just have to be my friend or your friend or Mike yeah. A's friend or whoever to know what's going on and to be aware of the exciting things that are happening. Yeah. That it, it's open to everyone. Yeah. And and then the second idea is to actually explore concepts or introduce people to new things. Yeah. Because the truth is is that I don't really want just a room full of executive chefs. No. I want the dishwasher, I want the server, I want the line cook, I want everybody yeah. to come because the only way our scene is going to grow is for everyone to feel like they're plugged in and for everyone to feel like they're a contributing part of the experience. Mm-hmm. And and so the idea of having um, uh, something demonstrated in some capacity that y- unifies the audience and gives everyone a level playing field about yeah. something. So the first one we did cocktails. So we <laughs> that had was a- that was a crazy hot fun mess. <laughs> so we had you know great cocktail people from the area come do artisanal cocktails. Yeah, and um, and and make them in front of everyone and yeah. talk a little bit about how they were making them. So that kind of got everybody, to hopefully, to sort of think about cocktails in a different way if they haven't been to Vera, if they haven't been to my case, yeah. if they're spending all their time freaking, you know, making steaks to temp and then drowning their sorrows <laughs> in Labatt's at home in the easy chair. <laughs> we wanted to make sure that they all got this cocktail experience. The next one that I was really excited about that we did was pairing olives with the actual olive oil they're yes. made from. So we paired up with Diavolio and people got to experience what it tastes like to have uh, you know, a Hoji Blanca olive oil with the actual Hoji Blanca olive. Yeah, that so that cool. you're not you don't go in and you look at varietal olive oils and think they all taste the same <laughs> and not understand that each one has all these unique characteristics that are based on the olive that it comes from. So we've done cheese, we've done all kinds yeah, of stuff, you know? Yeah. 
And some of them are fun. Like the post restaurant week one we did was just we bought everybody a beer and a shot because <laughs> God knows everyone had worked really hard yeah. at restaurant week and it was like why make this confusing? Why not just buy people beer and a shot? Yes. So it's uh, the idea spun from my friend Ivy Knight who yes. lives in Toronto. She's a great food writer um, and she's a great event coordinator and she is brilliant and I adore her and she runs an event called Eighty Sixth, uh, which is at the Drake Hotel every every Monday. Yes, yeah. And I've been to many of them. I'd like Um, to go to one next year. That's that's one of my goals. Oh, yeah. Well, we'll probably all go up sometime in January, so that'll be fun. But it's a a lot of fun, and it's it's way more non-restaurant people than restaurant people in the ones that I've been to. Okay. Um, And the chefs primarily come in, and they have a battle of some kind. So it's like the, (laughs) you know, the baked potato battle or the <laughs> meatball battle or whatever yeah. and then um and sometimes she has sponsors so they'll have a caviar tasting or they'll have a whatever kind of thing and it's a lot of fun it's a really totally different experience than in is but the idea of seeing all of these people having a place to go and knowing they could meet other people and that new chefs could come in and go there and they'd meet yeah. people was really intriguing to me and then last year bruce Wazela and mike a came to in came to 86th with me and we actually did an America versus Canada <laughs> smackdown or something on the 4th of July up there for 86th because it's not their 4th of July but whatever um, and uh, and Ivy said you know you guys should really do one of these in Buffalo and at the time Mike was looking at opening up Cantina Loco and opening yeah. the hotel so he had a couple of things on his plate yeah, a little bit going on and I also had a little bit going on and it wasn't just until this fall or this summer that I said to Mike, I said, you know, we really, we need to do this. Yeah. And and this would be great. And he, of course, agreed because he is as much about growing the community and giving people a reason to stay and be here and be part of what's going on as I am. Yeah. And so it was a no brainer and we've had a lot of fun. Yeah. It's been awesome. And so I I highly recommend, I mean, people are listening to this and it's free. Yeah. (laughs) That's the thing that people forget. It's It's free. Yes. You don't have to pay anything to get in the door. No, no. Um, But yeah, so I think when this posts, there should be one the following week. I'll double check when I when I post this. But, yeah, but uh, I think we're only doing one in December because the holidays are so oh, nuts. Okay. All right, then never mind. Then. Well, we'll we'll figure it out. But I, I mean, they're great events. I can't recommend going to them enough because I just have a blast. I work the whole time, so I'm I'm glad to hear that you have fun. <laughs> I mostly work. Yeah, but, I um, uh, I maybe have too much fun on the Monday <laughs> night when I have to work the next day at eight. But uh, I, I love it. And then you know, Lloyd shows up on, on, on occasion. Right, Lloyd, if we don't do a ton of food. If we yeah. do a ton of food, it doesn't really make sense for them to be there. But Mike's, the restaurant isn't open, C-Bar isn't open, yeah. so, uh, for the kitchen isn't. So when we, at 10 o'clock, Lloyd pulls up and yeah. we all move our tacoing selves outside. Oh, so good. It's the best. Yeah. And they love being part of it. You know, they, yeah. honestly, they said to me a lot, a lot of times, you know, Krista, we don't really care how busy we are, we just want to be part of it. And that's, <laughs> One of the things that I think has made Lloyd so successful is understanding that it's not about every dime you make every time. Yes. Sometimes you're there because you're part of something that's cool and and not complaining about it, and it's wonderful. Yeah, love those I guys. Can, I couldn't say any better. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, it kind of, I think, wraps it up. I I, <sighs> I know this is a it's gonna be a two parter. Oh, it's gonna have to be. <laughs> yeah. Um. How how was your 2012? Did I mean you were. We were crazy busy this year. Yeah. Uh, I think we're on pace to have 300 articles that we wrote this year. Wow. <laughs> and uh, That's a lot. Yeah. And um, it was it was probably our... Uh, it's easily our biggest year we've ever had. And this is year, the, f- the first year that I started to meet people. Right. This podcast has been a huge reason for that. But yeah. But it's kind of weird that I know these people. And I, well, ha- I have Steve uh, Gedra texting me a severed goat head... <laughs> Oh, I'm working. Oh, and I'm you know like, you're one of the popular kids when Steve Gedra's texting you body parts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it's it's kind of crazy for me. So 2012 has been, I mean, a, a good year, but just hectic. Yeah, I, you guys need, like, some downtime. We're going to take a... Because you're all so, like, cute and young. You can't be burnt out. We're going to scale it back next year, for yeah. sure. Um, 
but you were just as busy as I was this year. I, I've i been really, really busy. And actually, this year I was hoping would be a little quiet, but it hasn't been at all. It's been my busiest year so far. Nichols A. Chef started off this... I mean, it was probably your biggest thing that started off this year, besides yeah. all the work, obviously, you do with Buffalo Spree. But, right. Buffalo Spree definitely keeps me busy. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so Nickel City Chef and... Uh, it sold out in 45 minutes. Yeah, the Lloyd Show <laughs> sold out in six yeah. minutes. So see what that means about next year um but i can't complain i mean i feel terrible because i just want everybody to be able who wants to come to be able to come the whole thing makes me feel really sad but i i there's no way to be bigger and we've tried adding more shows before and it doesn't well yeah the second season was eight shows right? so yeah and then the farm tour this year was awesome that was a blast taste of buffalo was great yeah we had a lot of fun. We're going to, yeah. you know, do Taste of Buffalo again next year. Nice. There's some new exciting things going on with that that I'll tell you about in the future. And then um, Firing Line. Yes, Firing Line. Which is our new yeah. series, which is like Chopped. And so we've we've done the two preliminary matches and we're the big throwdown will be DJ yeah. versus Teddy. Love both those guys. So it'll be really yeah. cool and I'm excited. Um Cupcake Challenge sold out in a heartbeat. Yeah, I mean, that was packed. That crowd was, it was full. It was. So, you know, really, really busy. And then, of course, honestly, Donnie, 90% of my time is spent answering freaking email. I mean, I love that people email, but yeah, yeah. I get hundreds of emails every day from people who want to do something or want me to help them do something. And I am so flattered, and I think it's really awesome, but we, we, we need some self-starters to enter the scene. We need some p- folks who yeah. really just have gumption and have a mission and find a way to make it work and do their own thing. I don't care if they're my direct competitor. Yeah. Hop in, get busy, there's lots to be done, and there's people <laughs> who are willing to spend money on good meals and great experiences, so come on, chop, chop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what do you... I mean... Is there any goals that you have for 2013? To like, work less than 100 hours every week. That's a good goal. <laughs> I like that goal. Uh, I really can't continue to work at this pace. So I'm hoping to work a little smarter and yeah. a little less. And uh, and I, my goal in 2013 is to really um, dine fabulously as often as possible. <laughs> I love that. I love it. <laughs> it's a challenge, but me, I think I can manage. Me, me and you both, yeah. Yeah. So, no, I, I really, I just like to see Spree. We've got many issues with food themes coming out. Awesome. So, I will be spending Thank you a, so much for featuring me in Cheap yeah, Eats. Yeah, well, it was a no-brainer. Uh, you were easily, you know, out of food bloggers. I mean, come on, you guys are the <laughs> biggest food blog in town. But I think... Um, you know, we've got many, many food issues, so yeah. that'll definitely keep me really busy. Awesome. I've got some special projects going on that y'all will find out about in the near future. So, <laughs> yeah, never, never a dull moment. Nice. Well, Krista, thank you for everything this year. You've helped us out more than any other person I can think of. Not, uh, let alone from just starting this podcast by being the first person to <laughs> be our guinea pig. I was and- <laughs> so honored that you asked me. <laughs> um and uh, and just helping us, you know, with everyone we've met and with every event that we've gone to, you've been you've been our biggest supporter. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. You're gonna make me cry. You keep going. Though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll see. <laughs> and uh, everyone can tune in next week. It's gonna be me and Tommy, and we're going to do a best of 2012 podcast. So we're gonna take clips from everybody's episodes. Oh man. So yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. So, but thank you again, Chris, so much. My pleasure. <laughs>